Today, um, I need to go over circuits with you, uh, but the course has been kind of swapped around. We used to go over um, charges and current and electrical flow and electrical forces first. I think they've got it swapped to do that later in the course now. But I've got to give you some of that information now or you won't be able to understand circuits. So back in the day, you know, when Benjamin Franklin was experimenting with electricity, they knew that there were two different types of things, right? There were some things that were charged one way and some things were charged another, right? So they, they called the two charges plus and minus. And uh, they figured out that they could only separate it so small, right? So the smallest charge, they couldn't get any smaller than that. That small amount of charge was And they defined the charge after a guy, they gave the name of the chart type of the, the units of the charge after a guy that experimented with electricity back in the day. Uh, they called it coulombs. So there was no smaller unit of charge than 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Of course, the negative one had a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and the positive one had a charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Couldn't get any smaller than that. They didn't know what the positive charge thing was. They didn't know what the negative charge thing was. They just knew that they could divide it down to that small. So the positive charge things we now know are called protons. And the negative charge things are called electrons. And the reason why you can't get any smaller than that is because the charge of one electron is that much. Now, before they knew anything about electricity or what these things were, they knew that, let me show you an example here. All right, so here's my question. Is this, are the pluses moving to the left, right, which shifts the minus to the right? Or is the minus moving to the right? You really can't tell, can you? No, they had no clue. So they had a 50-50 chance. So they, they decided to define something called current, and they said current is the way that the positives are moving. Well, as we now know, protons are like 2,000 times bigger than electrons. So protons don't actually move, right? They're in the nucleus of the atom. They tend to stay in one place. It's the electrons that actually move. But from that time till now, still in every uh, textbook, current is defined to be the direction that the positives move. So if we have a wire and we say that the current is going this way, in reality what we mean are the electrons are going this way. So current is a completely um, metaphysical thing, right? It's not real. When we say current's going to the right, what we really mean is the electrons are going to the left. Every textbook in the world currently still follows that convention. All right, in order to uh, define current, we need to have some units for it. So we know we're talking about the charge flowing to the left or the right. So, so we say that current is equal to charge per second or charge per unit time. And with charges we use coulombs, right? With time we usually use seconds. So one coulomb 
flowing past per second, we give that a name. We call it an ampere after another famous scientist. A lot of times we don't say the whole word, we just say amps. And if you write the number down, like if you write a number down like 2.5A, you're indicating 2.5 amps of current. You guys sh should be becoming very familiar with this. Your phone chargers are usually either rated as 1 amp or 2.5 amps. Y'all know what the difference in the two chargers are? One's faster. So the 2.5 amp will charge your phone. It's called a rapid charger, right? And if you have a really old phone and you hook it up to a 2.5 amp charger, it may burn your phone out because they weren't built to handle that rapid a charging rate. The newer phones, like, you know, the Samsung 8, 9, and above probably, uh, or the newer iPhones, they're all made to rapid charge. Some of the older phones were not made to rapid charge, and if you hook them up to a rapid charger, then they'll burn them out. So, All right, so current is measured in amps. Um, there, was a, there was another thing that you need to know about current. First of all, in order to get current to flow, you have to have some kind of push because the electrons want to just settle with the closest proton and stay there, right? So we know that like charges repel. So if we get a whole bunch of negatives here in one area, they're going to want to push away from each other. If I have a whole bunch of positives over here, they would like to push away from each other, but they really can't. But if the negatives see, to the, pos see the positives, they're going to want to go over there and combine, right? Because positives and negatives attract. So opposites attract. in the electrical world and the dating world. So the very thing that, that will draw you to somebody because they're different from you will also annoy you later. But <laughs> All right, so opposite track, the, the electrons will try to flow over to the protons. If we can get a whole bunch of electrons in one place and a bunch of protons in one place, that, that provides this electrical force that makes the electrons want to move, right? That electrical push we call a voltage. So no current will ever flow without a voltage of some kind. So if we talk about a battery, you know, a battery has a positive end and a negative end. Basically, inside the battery, the chemicals are causing a buildup of electrons on one end and a, a lack of electrons on the other end. So it's pushing all the electrons to one end of the battery. And if we hook a wire to this, right, the electrons, they're trying to get away from each other. They start spreading out along the wire, and then they see the protons over here, and they start going faster and faster, right, and they, they can't wait to get over there. So all right, at the beginning of all this, you know, at the very beginning, we had Edison, who had invented the light bulb. I don't know if you know the story. Um, they knew that whenever electricity flowed through a wire, if it was a small enough wire, it would glow red hot. So Edison thought, well, man, if we could keep that glow going, we could light up a room with it. So um, he tried all of these different things when he was inventing the light bulb. One of the first things he figured out was if we don't, take all the air away from the wire, the wire is going to burn up quicker. So it oxidizes, right, and it starts to disintegrate. So he had a guy that would make glass bulbs for him, and he would pump all the air out of the glass bulb and put different things in here to try to see if he could make it light up. So he'd hook it up to, you know, some kind of a power source. He tried over 2,000 different materials here. 
before he actually got one that would glow and not just burn away immediately. So, I mean, he even tried things like human hair, right? He tried everything. So uh, one of the things that Edison is famous for, he said invention is 99% perspiration and only 1% inspiration. He believed that things could be invented by hard work, not just by, you know, a brilliant idea. So um, smart guy, I mean, he was ADD. He was very hyper. He couldn't sleep at night. He, he slept an average of four hours a night. He was very well respected in the town because he was involved in everything. You know, he was, he was a telegraph operator, and, you know, he was, he, he was just a very well-respected member of the community. He was quite smart. Uh, that, so Edison's the guy that did that. At the same time, there was a guy by the name of Tesla. And Tesla may have been more brilliant than Einstein. Tesla's probably one of the smartest men that's ever lived. Nikola Tesla, yeah. So um, you got to remember, they were just starting to explore electricity. Nikola Tesla invented things like particle beam weapons. He had, uh, you know, lightning flying from towers one place to another in his house. He, uh, he actually had a plan to power our houses without any wires. So, and it involved something along these lines, using a microwave beam, beaming it to your house and catching it with an antenna and reconverting the microwave energy back into electricity again. So, of course, poor bird that flies through the microwave, you know, it's kind of, yeah, instant cook. But anyway, very, very brilliant guy. He was so brilliant that he scared everybody to death. They thought like he was a witch, you know. They, 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 they thought he was going to blow up their town or open a gate to the pits of hell or something, you know, and I mean, just very, very. So um, Edison had this idea after he invented the, after he came up with the light bulb. He said, uh, "Let's uh, let's have a power company, and we're going to ship electrons to your house, right? And then we'll just send the electrons to your house, and they'll come back to us, right? We'll provide a big negative end and a big positive end here." Right, we'll ship the electrons to your house. You can send them through your light bulb and they'll make it get hot and glow. Right, as the electrons are going through the wire, it will glow. And everybody can have lighting at home. And Tesla said, That's a, you're an idiot. He said, uh, so we're sending all these electrons to your house. What if the house next to you is not wired for electricity? What if something happens and they can't flow back to us here, right? So we're sending a whole bunch of extra electrons to your house. What if they start to build up here in your house? I mean, what happens when the electrons build up in the clouds and there's none on the ground? You get a lightning strike. Can you imagine a lightning strike sideways? <laughs> so, um, so Tesla said, uh, look, dude. There are already electrons in your wire. We don't need to send you electrons. Let's just take those electrons and push them that way a little bit and then pull them back this way. So we're just going to do this with them, right? Just push and pull on them. They'll be going back and forth through the wire. They were already right there anyway. And we can still make the wire gl glow right, white hot because it's got electrons flowing back and forth in it. So uh, Edison's idea was something called DC, direct current. So he wanted to send a current, uh, just a steady current to the houses of electricity, of electrons. Tesla was talking about something called alternating current. So today, I mean, at first, everybody went with what Edison wanted to do, and then they quickly realized that that was not very efficient. And uh, Tesla eventually won. And today, all of our houses are powered by AC. So the uh, power outlet on the wall is 110 volts of push, and it cycles back and forth 60 times per second, 60 hertz. So it's just uh, the voltage goes this way, and then it goes that way. It goes this way, and then it goes that way. And they do that with generators that have magnets that flip, right? They flip directions. 
So all a generator is is a motor that runs that you you turn the spindle manually, right? Which creates electricity. You can either send electricity to a motor to make the spindle turn, or you can turn the spindle and create electricity. So they put a big paddle wheel on it and stick it in a waterfall, right? And it creates alternating current. Um, all right. So we do use AC today, and the reason why your outlet is so dangerous is because alternating current, not alternating current, even though that's only 110 volts and you can have a taser that's a million volts, how many electrons are available in the wires around here to go through your body? A lot. In your little handheld taser, there's a limited number of electrons that can flow through your body, right? So even though it has a big push, there's a small amount of electrons. In the wall, it's a smaller push, but there's a large number of electrons. It's the current that will kill you, the, the, number of, the amount of charge that goes through your body, not the voltage push. Okay? So, uh, yeah, so don't stick a bobby pin in the outlet and see what will happen. It's not a good thing, right? If you can't turn loose of it, you will die. Yes. Yes. So if you held a taser on somebody and you could hold it onto them for, you know, for a minute, then it would definitely kill them, right? The problem is you're going to run out of electrons. So whereas if you stick, your, stick something in an electrical outlet, the first thing that happens is your mus muscles clench, right? And you can't turn loose. And you're sitting there and more and more electrons are going through you, right? It'll literally cook you. So from the outside in. All right, so let's get back to circuits. All right, uh, a basic circuit, you know, would look something like this. Now, there is a problem with this circuit, right? We have a voltage source. We have a wire. Hey, what does this look like? Anyway, what's the shape of this? It's a circle, right? You all see why we call them circuits, right? Because the electricity basically has to flow from the voltage source back to the voltage source. It flows around this circle. If at any point we break the wire or something, then it's called a, it's called a broken circuit, right? A short circuit. Actually, if we... If we needed to go all the way around here and if something falls across there like there and, and doesn't let it go through the rest of it, then that's called a short circuit. So, All right, the problem with this, if any of you actually hooked a wire up to a battery like this, have you ever done that? What happens? It gets hot, right? It gets really hot. You'll burn your fingers because the electrons are rushing from one end of the battery to the other so fast, right? that it literally, it, you'll burn out your battery in just a, you know, a minute or less. And the wire gets super hot, just like the wire in a light filament gets hot. And uh, you'll, you'll mess up your battery and probably burn yourself. So what we have to do is we have to include some extra components in this circuit, something that will slow down the current of electricity. Anything that slows down the current of electricity, we call a resistor. Right? If it slows down current, it's called a resistor. And I got to tell you, even wires are not perfect conductors. They have some resistance. It's just very small. Right? You have conductors and you have resistors. A wire is a conductor, but it has a little bit of resistance. It's just very tiny. However, if you're trying to run speakers across a long drop, right, then that little bit of resistance grows the longer your wire is. So, um, all right, so what we need to do is include something in our circuit to slow down the electricity, like a battery. I mean, like a, sorry, like a light bulb. One side of the wire goes to the side of the battery. The other one goes to the tip. And inside it looks like this. 
as it goes through that filament that's got some resistance, the filament gets hot, right? But it's slowing down the current. So um, anything that slows down the current we call a resistant, a resistor. So a light bulb is just a form of resistor. We don't usually draw um, these things, these circuits, with the actual pictures of the things. We usually uh, use something called a schematic. Check them. And in the schematic, we use symbols to represent the different things. So this circuit, then we would probably draw it Instead of drawing the battery and the light bulb, we use this symbol to represent a battery. Positive and negative into the battery. And a zigzag line represents a resistor. Those are just two examples of schematic symbols. We will use those a lot. We usually label the uh, battery's voltage. You know, maybe this is 24 volts. Uh, resistance is measured in another unit called ohms. So Ohm was another famous uh, physicist, scientist who experimented with circuits and electri electricity. We define the unit of resistance to be ohms. So um, if this resistor, for example, was two ohms, the symbol that we represent ohms by is the Greek symbol omega. So if I was reading this to somebody, I would say, yeah, it's got a voltage of two, 24 volts and a resistance of 2 ohms. The current is measured in charge per second, which is in amps. So you'd probably have something like 12 amps going around the, around the circuit. By the way, I drew it the wrong way. I drew it the way elect electricity would flow, but the current's actually the other way. So, Assuming I've got my positive and negative ends right on the battery. Actually, maybe I haven't. Yeah, now it's right, I think. All right, everything in our world uh, revolves around some kind of circuit. So, oh, I meant to tell you all this as well. Uh, if you have a laptop charger, has anybody got their charger running right now? That, that big box right there is actually something called a transformer. So it's taking the AC from the wall. So it's kind of like a gear and a cog. In the wire that goes from that box to your laptop, all the current goes one way. So it's like a big loop, you know, like a cog and gear. It, it keeps pushing it all one way. So that box is a transformer that transforms AC to DC. So your computers all run off of DC. And most of the stuff we're going to talk about is DC because most computer circuits require the current to flow one way. So AC is a perfect way to get power to your house, but powering your computers and uh, electronic devices, you need DC, so you have some kind of transformer. Just like the little thing that you plug in to power your phone, it's a little transformer that transforms AC to DC and provides you, yeah, it, 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 provides, uh, it provides you a direct current of 1 amp or 2.5 amps to your phone. All right, there are two basic types of circuits that we're going to be looking at. 
And I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to explain about capacitors, inductors, transformers, all of the different things you might see in computer circuits. But the only ones that, were really, that you're really going to be responsible for are for basic resistor circuits. So with a resistor, I can do something like, uh, let's say I had 24 volts and my computer only needs 5 volts. Well, I can run it across a few resistors and drop the voltage push, right? Imagine if I had a pipe and I put a piece of uh, sponge in the pipe, right? The pressure on one side of the sponge would be higher than the pressure on the other side. The same thing with a resistor. The, the voltage pressure is higher on one side of a resistor than it is on the other one. So if I needed less than 24 volts, I could put some resistors in there and drop the voltage. All right, so let's look at the first of our basic circuits. This would be a circuit with a voltage source and two resistors like this. So let's say that this uh, I have a resistor here that's um, two ohms and a resistor here that's four ohms. This type of circuit is called a series circuit. It's called a series because the electrons have to go through one resistor before they can get to the next one. Just like the World Series, you have to play one game before you can get the next game, right? Everything is in order one after the other. So there are some things that are noteworthy about series circuits. First of all, there's only one path. Electrons don't have more than one way they can go. So if I had one amp of current coming out here, that one amp of current is made up of, you know, trillions, millions of trillions of electrons. Little Sammy electron right here, there is no choice. If he goes this way in the wire, he's got to go through that resistor, he's going to wind up over here. Right? He's going to eventually wind up over here. Eventually, he's going to wind up over here. There's only one path, right? So if I got one amp of current here, I'm going to have the same one amp of current over here. And I'll have the same one amp of current over here. There's only one way for the electrons to flow. So the current is the same everywhere. All right, so let's say that uh, I had my pipe with my sponge, right? And it's slowing down the water, the push of the water some. What would happen if I added a second sponge after the first sponge? It would slow it down even more, right? So if I have two resistors, right, then it's resisting even more than it was before. Well, what I'd really like to know is, what is kind of the total resistance of my current going through this circuit? How much is the battery being resisted? You can get the total resistance in a series circuit really easy. You just add them up. 2 plus 4, 6 ohms. So the resistance resistors just add. So my total resistance is just uh, 6 ohms. That's pretty easy, right? All right. Um, ohm, the re one of the reasons why we call resistors after ohm is he came up with a rule. He said there's a relationship between the voltage and the resistance and the current in the circuit. They said the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. This is called Ohm's Law. So
So if I know any two of these, I can figure out the third one. My battery is 12 volts. My total resistance is 6. So my battery is 12 volts. My total resistance is 6 ohms. Let me write down a triangle for this. I times R. Put the V in the other spot. If I wanted to know what the I was, right? I could do algebra or use the triangle. I would be equal to V divided by R. The current would be equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. So what, what would my current be in this case? So 12 divided by 6 would be 2. So now I've got 2 amps of current. If I've got two amps of current here, I'm going to have two amps of current here. I'm going to have two amps of current here. It's the same two amps of current over here, right? <coughs> we said that the, volt, the pressure drops every time you go across a resistor, right? Just like a sponge in the pipe slowing down water. So how much does the voltage drop whenever it goes across this resistor? Well, I know I got two amps going through there. I've got two amps going through that resistor, and the resistor is two ohms. So how much does the voltage drop whenever I go across that resistor? Two times two would be four. So my voltage drops by four volts when I go across there. I started off with 12. If it drops by four, what's left? 12 minus 4, yeah, that would be 8 volts left by the time I get over here. Let's check the next one. We got 2 amps coming through this one, right? I got 2 amps coming into this resistor, and it's got a resistance of 4. What would be the voltage drop across it? Times 8. So it's going to drop by 4 volts across this one and by 8 more volts across this one. So if I drop by 4 and 8, how much have I dropped total? 4 and 8, 12. I started with 12 volts. I've dropped all 12 volts by the time I get back around to the battery again. That's the way it works. So all of the voltage drops add up to the voltage of the battery. So now I have some basic rules. If I can remember these rules, it may make solving a series circuit easier, right? The current's the same everywhere. The resistors add up to the total. The current, if I want to get the current coming out of the battery, I just need the total resistance and the voltage. The total resistance and the voltage, I can get the current. Let's look at a parallel circuit which is the other type of circuit. So in a series circuit, there's only one path. So I, can, I bet you all can guess what the parallel circuit is. More than one path. So here's a parallel circuit. My battery. Come over here. I can either go through this resistor or I can go through this resistor. See, when the current comes here, it has a choice. It can go this way or this way. Uh, this is actually the way your house is wired in parallel. 
because the Providence series if you go through this room and then you go through this room and you go through this room right if the light bulb burns out in this room all of the lights in your house would go out right because there's nowhere for electricity to flow Whereas in this case, right, if one of the light bulbs burn out, it can still go through the other one. So a parallel circuit has some other things. It's the same kinds of rules, just a little bit different. So let's do the same thing. Let's say that this is 24 volts. And this is 2 ohms. And this is 6 ohms. So the first is the current can't be the same everywhere because it splits up, right? See right here, part of the current goes this way and part of it goes that way. So let's see if we can come up with some rules for parallel. By the way, tomorrow you're going to build this circuit in a simulator. All you're going to do is put uh, light bulbs where the resistors are, right? You should be able to make them both glow. All right, what is the same everywhere in a parallel circuit? Well, let's see. Here's my battery. It's touching that resistor. Do you see that? My battery is directly touching that resistor. If I ignore these wires, right, my battery is actually touching that resistor as well. Can you see how the battery doesn't have to go through a resistor to touch either one of those? It can touch both of those resistors. So the thing that's the same everywhere is the voltage. Whatever the voltage of the battery is, that's the voltage across the 2-ohm resistor. That's the voltage across the 6-ohm resistor. Uh, that's just the it's not really a rule, it's just a way to keep track of which one's which. The voltage is the same everywhere. Uh, the resistors, how the resistors add. This one's a little bit tricky. So this is the only thing that's tricky about circuits. If you're trying to get the total resistance of the circuit in a parallel circuit... Let me explain what I mean. If I want to get the resistance of this circuit, the first thing I need to do is flip the two resistors. So it would be 1 over 2 plus 1 over 6. Flip them and add them. If I multiply this one times 3 over 3, right, then that would be 3 times 1 is 3, 3 times 2 is 6. Oops, how did I get a 2? So now I can add them. That would be 4 6. You know why I can multiply times 3 over 3, right? What is 3 over 3? Yeah, you can multiply any number by 1. It's still the same number. So if I multiply times 3 over 3, I can get the bottom to be a 6. And then I can add the 2. So this is flipping and adding them. The last thing I need to do is flip it back. So the resistance of this circuit would be six-fourths of an ohm, or three-halves, or one-and-a-half. That's a little bit tricky. You don't always have to do that, and here's why. I know the voltage across this resistor is 24 volts, right? The voltage is 24 volts across that resistor. I know the resistor is 2 ohms. What does my current have to be? 2 times 1 is 24. 12, right? So I could get that I got 12 amps coming through this one. 
My voltage across this one is 24. Something times 6 ohms. So that one has to be 24 divided by 6. 6 times 4 is 24. So this would be 4 amps. So I had 12 amps that went this way and 4 amps that went that way. How much had to be over here if I, after I split, I got 12 and 4? After I split it up, 12 went this way and 4 went that way. How much was over here before I split it? 12 and 4, add them together. So it would be 16, right? So I must have started off with 16 amps. Then it split and 12 went this way and 4 went that way. So now if my voltage is 24 and my total current coming out of the battery is 16 amps, Sixteen times one and a half would be twenty-four, so we could get our resistance that way. We wouldn't have to flip, add, flip if you just worked backwards. All right. So the two types of circuits. Uh, the last thing is um, the current adds up to the total, which is what we just did. So twelve plus four adds up to the sixteen. This, by the way, the fact that this current plus this current have to equal to that current is called Ampere's Law. So Ohm's Law is the formula. Ampere's Law is just a reminder that, er that things can't miraculously disappear or go away. If you start with 16 and you got 12, the other four has got to be over there. So tomorrow you're going to run a simulator and you're going to build a series circuit so you're going to take a battery and two light bulbs and put them one after another get them to light up take a screen capture of it and then uh, you're going to do the same thing but you're going to make a parallel circuit and take a screen capture of it and that's all you have to do tomorrow tomorrow is a pep rally schedule i mean not pep rally it's a half day schedule so you'll only have about 25 minutes in class to do that so